at one point one woman asked you to cast a spell on Jennifer Jason Lee. Oh, yeah, yeah, one of my regulars. And she told me she hated Jennifer Jason Lee. Uh, I never particularly liked her either, but I didn't think much of it. Don't forget, this is the same woman who asked me, told me that the CIA was following her. And so she asked me to cast a joint spell on both the CIA and Jennifer Jason Lee. She was convinced that somehow they were in cahoots together to get her. Um, and so um, I did. I told her to say, oogly, oogly, bop, make J.J. Lee end up not on top. And so I get this woman who's quite old saying over and over again, oogly, oogly, bop, make J.J. Lee end up not on top. Oogly, oogly, bop, make J.J. Lee end up not on top. And then I walked her through a recipe for a potion of milk and orange juice and a splash of soy sauce and saliva, and it took about 21 minutes into all. And, um, you know, at 21 minutes, she's spending about over $80. Um, and then she promised to wash her hair with a potion before she went to sleep. And I know she did, because the next day she called me and said she thought she had made a mistake because she hadn't included the saliva, and so I made her do it again. How did you feel about having this much control over somebody else? I actually really, really hated it. I really hated it. It was just sickening in some sense. Um, well, there's something a little like sadistic about it, almost to hear you say it. Yeah, there is. I, 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 um, I, I hated what I was doing. Um, they get something out of it, but I, the reason I ended up leaving was because they really don't get what they think they're getting. It's sort of therapy. Um, and that's how the psychic networks justify it, that it's, you know, the freedom to contract and the freedom to have therapy and the freedom to do what you want with your money. But it's all based in deception. And the problem is the other side doesn't really know they're being deceived. Is it your impression that most of the people who you were working with, the people who you had contact with in the psychic network, um, actually believed they were psychics and actually believed that they could help people as psychics? Uh, the psychics I dealt with all believed they were psychics without exception. Uh, none of them. Occasionally I'd approach them and try to like cozy up to them and say, come on, we all know we're in on the scam. And they took that very, very, very poorly. Uh, they all really believed they were psychics. Do you think that there's a different um, kind of moral judgment uh, that would be rendered in this whole experience if you believe you were, in fact, psychic. Yeah. Um, I think if, if, you're, if you're not psychic, you can do this better. But if you are psychic, you can live with yourself doing this. But I guess what makes this really complicated and difficult is this is a strange situation where people on the other end of the line are paying a lot of money for something that the people on th that they think they're getting, which they really aren't, but the people giving it to them also think they're giving it. So everybody involved in the transaction thinks this is true. At one point towards the end of your time as a psychic, you got a call from a woman who told you this horrific story about how she had been beaten by her father when she was a kid. Um, and now she was involved with this man, and, and he was sleeping with somebody else in the other room as you were on the line with her. Right, I could hear the, he liked sex rough, and I could hear the screams and yells in the background. And I thought it was her child. Um, but no, it was You her, thought it was a child husband. making noise, yeah. Right, and it was her husband having sex with the, sort of the local floozy. Um, yeah, she told me the story. She had grown up in a Midwestern state. And um, when the professional football team in that state lost uh, or missed a touchdown, she would get beat often with, like, a bike chain. Um, it was a very, very, very hard phone call for me. Um, it was, it, that, that was a really hard phone call. There's a moment you describe where, where she's crying and you're crying and you're just silent for, for a minute or two, not sure what to say at all. Yeah, there was. There, I, I, I can still hear her in my head. She was sitting there weeping, and there's the screams in the background from her husband and this other woman, and I, I, I'm also crying. And at the same time, beside me on my desk is my stopwatch, which is going off and calculating how much money she is paying for this. And this is money this woman didn't have. And um, 
was just, I, I was a contributing problem in her life. You know, she needed me in some sense, but by needing me, I was making it much worse. That was sort of the end for me. That was the end for you? Yeah. Because, because I, you just felt like there was nothing that you could do for her. I, I just hated myself for doing this, actually. Did, did you feel like you were just stealing money from strangers? I, I was stealing money from strangers. Um, there's, there's no way to put it nicely. I mean, it's, look, it's, in some ways it's a great story. But in the end, I was just robbing people. People who could least afford it. Stephen Glass is an associate editor at the New Republic magazine. His article about working in the phone psychic business will be in the February issue of Harper's Magazine. Thank <laughs> you.